Um, in July and August of 1965, driving an automobile that my parents had given me uh, for graduation from Vanderbilt. It did not have an air conditioner. <laughs> <laughs> I was impressed as I approached Easton from Beaumont on Interstate 10 with how flat South Texas was. In fact, I realized that when you went over an overpass, you could see about 25 miles. <laughs> I was particularly impressed when I slowed down to come into Houston and roll the windows down at the humidity. <laughs> and I realized it probably had been an oversight not to include an air <laughs> but after finishing my graduate work in the same automobile, uh, I realized that it is survivable, although you have to learn how to live with damper clothing. <laughs> but those were really exciting times in Houston. Uh, the Gemini program was going on. We were going to the moon um, just down the road. Uh, I think it's a thing called the Manned Space Race. Uh, all of this was happening, and we wanted to be space explorers, as we said. And so the department here, which was one of the first departments to do space science, was a wonderful place to be. And in fact, it was a terrific experience, um, lots of uh, new knowledge, lots of very special people, faculty, students, and I want to thank everybody here um, who has been part of the Rice legacy. It's been a, just a wonderful, successful activity. I want to share just a few thoughts on the scientific topic of very basic topic. How does the Earth's space environment, the magnetosphere, get filled up with plasma? Does it come from the sun or does it come from the earth? Or does it come from both? And in what this, and then I want to share a few thoughts on just the exploration process. Okay, so here's here's the solar terrestrial system. Scale is not quite right, but the solar terrestrial <laughs> system, as we were talking about it at Rice in 1965, solar wind, um, clearly the supplier of all the plasma in the magnetosphere, comes in through the polar cusp and somehow back through the tail, fills up the magnetosphere. Very convenient, the solar wind energy for the sun to talk to what you see in the plasma sheet, same composition, all the way one nature composition, and seemed to be the type of light energy to make the report. So that was a good that was a good uh, approximation of what was happening. Many space physicists today still think this is the dominant picture. And I want to just uh, give some insight into other ways that one might think of it. Uh, science has a lot of serendipity to it. Uh, my work here with Brian O'Brien was uh, sounding like the payload for Mary Westerling, uh, combined with some calculations of how a raw electron put their energy in the gap and put them in uh, that were done at Lockheed by Mark Wall. Um, and so my thesis was a combination of those two, and I ended up working at Lockheed for a and then. Uh, was offered a job there. So I went to the Lockheed Research Lab in Palo Alto and I finished my degree here. Okay. So to do a law of physics, the same thing on PhD at some time. So serendipity number one happened when Dick Johnson, my boss, came in one morning. Well, um, the grant that we have to support the Aurora work is running out of money. And uh, so, but fortunately, he said, uh, there's a new instrument that was just launched from the Orbital Geophysical Service, or Orbital 5, which is a <coughs> mass spectrometer that measures very low energy particles, not a lower particles, very low energy particles. And you might be interested in working on that, given the option of not working at all. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, I spent the rest of my career on plasma. So, that serendipity of, of that financial serendipity um, really changed my entire uh, lifetime. Um, the X 
Horizon Adventure is all of us are very curious. Um, most people are curious. People who do exploration are curious and motivated enough to go to try, to try to find out why the world is the way it is. Very determined. This is not easy stuff to do. Uh, very persistent. And you have to be an optimist. I think if you were a pessimist trying to be a, a science explorer, you wouldn't last very long. Just too complicated. Too many things that you have to work through to make it happen. And when when I worked on the orbit of the plasma tables from the over that way, it was to understand this region called the plasma sphere. Um, ionospheric people talk the plasma sphere apart from the magnetosphere. Magnetospheric people didn't care about it because it was so low energy, it had to be part of the atmosphere. And so when I used to try to get thought to the ACU, they didn't know where to put the thought at the time it was magnetospheric. Uh, and, but we had no illusion that the low energy plasma was the atmosphere had anything to do with population. So we were fully into this idea. So we learned a lot about the plasma sphere and wanted to build an instrument that could do a better job measuring how the particles come up from the atmosphere to fill up the plasma. So it was a different type of instrument. It turned out that at about that time, um, NASA offered me a job to come to the Marshall Space Flight Center and work on uh, magnetospheric physics things as well as some shuttle payload things. And um, so I did that. And not too long after that, Dave Reisner joined us there, a wonderful man, it was delightful to be able to spend those years with Dave. Uh, Jim Birch, who had finished the tour in Vietnam and then was a jotter came and joined us along with a lot of other people. And several years later, Alex Jessup came there to run the overall space contest. So it was a lot of life input in what was, what was going on there. So uh, we proposed a new instrument that could measure the low energy plasma, but could also measure its energy and which way it was flowing and that sort of thing. You wanted to figure out how it moved up out of the atmosphere and fill the magnetic. And so uh, Jim Birch and I both wrote proposals, and his was accepted for the meeting energy plasma on a new spacecraft called Dynamic 4. And then we had a, an instrument called a retarding ionic spectrometer to the energy as well as the mass. These are the two dynamic explored spacecraft sitting on top of the rocket. Here's the top of the rocket. This is in the room. This is at um, I don't know, in the west coast of Vandenberg, Monica. So they launched at the same time. The low, low altitude one was thrown off first on the way up, and then the high altitude was put into an orbit with about four RE altitude. And the instrument right here with the, with the aperture around it was retarding the time they So uh, that mission flew, and um, in the process of preparing for it, the second serendipity came along. We were interested in the plasma sphere. That's a low latitude. There was not enough telemetry data to take data all the way around the orbit of the dynamic 4A. So we had to have this compromise meeting among the experimenters as to whether we were going to run the spacecraft when it was low latitude or when it was over the polar cap. There were people who wanted both, and so you did this grand compromise, and you end up with an operational plan that says sometimes we'll run at the low latitude, and sometimes we'll run to the high latitude. As is often the case, and it's always been mentioned, already been mentioned, um, the things that you weren't looking for that you find are more important than the things you, you thought you were looking for. And in this case, the measurements over the fall, which we weren't interested in, turned out to be incredibly important. Because when we looked over the pole, there was just stuff flowing out of the atmosphere all the time at a variety of energy. And this picture just shows the schematic of that. The orbit of space dynamics explore spacecraft up to four Earth radii high. We see classical solar wind that is very low energy, one EV stuff flowing out all out of the polar cap, and then more accelerated polar wind associated with the aurora zone. 
lots and lots and lots of work. And we can only see those when we put a negative potential on the aperture around the instrument. So spacecraft typically charge positively. If you're trying to measure positive ions, they don't get the space. So over here you can see these little lines. That's where we have an aperture bias negative in front of the instrument and the spacecraft is extending. Every time it looks down, it sees stuff pouring up out of the ion. So we started asking ourselves, where does all this stuff go? And we were originally just concerned about the plasma sphere, but it's coming up out of the polar cap, everywhere outside of the plasma sphere, the stuff moving up. So we said, where does it go? Tom Moore and uh, Hunter White, I was kind of thinking about that. And we said, you know, this is bound, somehow this stuff is bound to be contributing to filling the magnetic sphere up. Not the solar wind, but the wind. But these particles are very low energy. And we, we said, well, they're pouring out of the polar cap. So the, the lighter ions at a given energy are going to go farther back in the tail. You're not going to see them up when they're in the water because the spacecraft is charged positively and you can't see them. But once they get to the plasma sheet and they move in a distended magnetic field, we're going to get in it. Then you'll start to see them in the plasma. So oh, a lot of flow out of this is 1987. So, so there's a lot of flow out of the lower cap back into the tail. Gets energized, makes the plasma sheet plus all which makes the rain come. Very different from solar wind making this stuff. Dominic Bell Four came and worked with us. He did some really nice modeling of this start. So this is looking. The sun's to the left, the earth is in the middle. If you start a particle with very low energy out of the polar cap and watch it move through the magnetic field and then the then the cross tail potential, if you look at what happens to the energy, it starts down here at a few EV, centrifugal accelerates and then skin, by the time it gets back towards the tail, it comes up to about a K EV. This is um, Curvature of lift lets it move in the direction of the cross field and the All of a sudden, it looks like a plasma sheet particle, which is a thousand light years old. One. And then as it drifts in, the energy goes all the way up to 10 k. So here's a way that you make these two regions, the plasma sheet and the rain current, out of particles that started out of the atmosphere with one to two. Very different sort of way to think about it. We wanted to know more about the particles that were flowing out. So you need an instrument that's better than just an ionometric number. You need an instrument with a big open. And so this, this is the, the tie on the thermal ionodynamics report from the design of the polar. And these instruments out of here are very large. And they go. They go on who was mentioned. As we mentioned several times, designed to kind of fly apart. It's really nice and sturdy. So it flew on forward, and we, we, we also flew an instrument that could block the spacecraft potential close to zero. So we could actually see out and see ions that were very low energy. When we did that, there's polar wind everywhere, classical QEDs flowing out. There's the oil, um, both oxygen, helium plus, hydrogen plus flowing out of our energy, filling up, presumably filling up the plasma. And we're actually able to measure a little bit in the low to the tail as the stuff moves out. Not much, but just a little bit. Because the spacecraft potential control device was not run very often. So other experiments were concerned that it was going to distort the weight environment. So a lot of compromise. So that led to uh, a thesis that uh, Matthew Huddleston did. Matthew did his um, master's degree in Boston. And he looked at the polar data. We used the polar data. We used the ion trajectory. We did the calculations. And you get an idea that shows you that there's gaseous plasma coming out of the atmosphere to make the different regions of the magnetosphere. But it doesn't tuck in from the table out of the when it starts in the atmosphere and flows out. And this is just a schematic that shows that flow happening. Depending on where the 
time to get to the plasma sheet, they come back through the magnetosphere with different energy. So if they don't go back very far, they drift back through the magnetosphere and then if they go back farther, they have more energy. So just to wrap up, then, this idea was still not very well accepted. Four years ago, the measurements were made by the closest spacecraft, which successfully measured the low energy plasma moving through the lows of the tail of the plasma. Uh, this was done in a very difficult and um, effective way, but now one finds that if you go and look at the magnetosphere of source and things, and it gives you a very different way to think about it. There's the picture, our picture from 1965. And then this is the picture today, where instead of the solar wind filling up the magnetosphere, the dominant production comes out of the Earth itself. It gets energized because of the solar wind production from the Earth itself. So um, I think just in, in summary that all of us who've been here have had the chance to learn and become space explorers. Uh, it has given us a wonderful life. It's a great privilege to get to do that. And it's a great privilege to get to give back to our country who has supported us to do these things and to give back in the way of new knowledge as well as technology that can be important to our country. Thank you. Can you use the alpha to close uh, alpha to AT for a uh, regular that's coming out of the ionosphere to get the ratio of protons that originate in the ionosphere from those that originate in the solar wind? I think that's helpful, Bill, but it's not conclusive uh, because there's a lot of things that get started up and things align. But what we, what we can tell is that there's enough from the point of view of the question manager in the situation is enough density and the energy is alive and as we do more and more composition <laughs> the composition will be alive as well but we can go any other questions <laughs> would you say it's fair to say that the answer is some of each <laughs> some of each and interestingly the modeling, and this is the gem program, the MSS gem program, the modeling shows that if you, if you merge an atmospheric outflow model, a, a good one, like a proxmark type, you know, that model, put that as input into the magnetic model, that the, the atmosphere is dominant when you have a south of the atmosphere. Pushes all the outer polar plasma into the plasma sheet that gets energized to make what you see. The solar wind is almost not a position. On the northward island, the, the solar wind can pinch in from the sides of the tail and make the contribution. But then the magnetosphere is not in a very active state. So from the storm point, then you get um, more of an opposite dominance. It is a mix, but it is affected by what the solar wind is coming up to. Okay, just a little bit of thank you very much again. Thank you.